Dude, I totally dropped the ball on thinking this through. What's up, everyone? Jason here from JTV Life. Welcome back to all my loyal followers. We just cracked 200 subscribers the other day, which is a huge milestone, and I couldn't have done it without y'all. The feedback and the participation in the comment section has been awesome and I really can't thank you enough. Don't forget you can always reach out to me at my email at justthinkfast at gmail.com with any comments or suggestions. You don't got to join Patreon. You don't got to get a paid subscription to reach out to me directly. Just hit me up on my email and I'll get back as fast as I can. All that I ask is if you like the content that I'm doing, subscribe and if you find value in these videos, hit that like button. Here at JTV Life, I'm just a dude with a camera and an email trying to build a community of millennial tinkers. Mods, hacks, reviews, how-tos, that's pretty much the main focus of my channel here, but I am a millennial with ADHD, so I can't promise to always stay on task. Take today's video. We're gonna be talking about the five things that I wish that I would have known or at least paid attention to or considered before we got our backyard chicken flock. Release the Dadas! <laughs> Today I'm coming to you live and unfiltered from my backyard right outside of the Coupe de Ville. It's a big old hunk of wood that I put together using some scrap wood, a little bit of wood we had to purchase and some hardware. At the end of the video, I'll, I'll do a tour of this for those of you that are interested in building your own coop in the backyard. Kind of see how I did it with minimal effort and uh, minimal new materials. The first thing that you need to know before you get chickens is that chicks will die and you need to know where you are getting your chicks from and that they are a reputable breeder. Our chicken adventure started one night just sitting around the backyard thinking about how cool it would be to have some new pets. My mother-in-law always liked the look of these silky chickens so we figured hey let's check them out. One quick little google and we saw enough images on social media to know that these are the chicks that we want. We jumped on over to Craigslist, a little bit of typing away and we found someone that was selling them in our area. One of the main reasons that we got drawn to the Silkies is they are a more petite chicken and they're very mild tempered. So they're good around kids and they're known as lap chicken. So this was right up our alley. A quick email to the woman that was selling them on Craigslist and I was in my car heading to a parking lot in Oakland to pick them up. Should have been my first red flag. But anyways, I just went YOLO, brought my phone. I was going to Venmo her whatever they costed. I mean, how much could they possibly cost? I was using a price anchor of a goat. I saw at a flea market one time for 65 bucks. So I was like, well, how much could a chicken cost? Well, I was in for a surprise. Once I loaded that little Amazon box with two chicks into the back of my Atlas, pulled out my phone and asked her how much I owed her. And it was $140. These chicks were $70 each. Poor old Daisy was only $70. And she's the best dog in the world. Chinese people do not say 你好吗? It's totally a translated sentence. Now the reason that the silkies cost a little bit more is because there was some additional cost involved with sexting them. <clears throat> now when it comes to chickens, you got your females, which are hens, and your males, which are roosters. The particular breed of the silky, you're not able to tell this until later on. So you want to get them DNA tested ahead of time just to make sure you don't end up with a rooster here in Alameda. Not allowed to have no roosters. And you don't want to take care of a bird for eight, nine, ten months before you realize that it's not even going to lay eggs and you can't keep it. So it's a little bit of security knowing that your birds are in fact hens, but it does cost a little more. I was thinking since this little DNA test cost between 10 and 20 bucks and the chicks that were non-sex were 20, that they'd only be about 40, 45, but she gouged me for the full seven zero on each. After I picked up the chicks, I headed on over to my local feed store to pick up the needed items. I was gonna make a little brooding box out of a big Rubbermaid tote. In the meantime, while I was waiting on a larger solution, I went on into the feed store to grab the things I needed and I saw that they had chicks there too and they were only $6 a piece. What a 
deal. So I decided to get two more and raise our flock number up to four. My reason for this is that silkies are not known to be spectacular egg layers. And I figured if I was doing all the work of having chickens, I might as well have a few that are going to produce eggs. So I caught two buff Orphantons and they're known to lay about 250 a piece a year. Another plus to these chickens that I picked up at the feed store is that they had a 95% certainty that they were hens and not roosters. And this is because the particular breeds that they sell at the feed store are what they call sex link, which means there's certain little characteristics or traits and they can look at the bird from the day it hatches to within a few days and tell whether it's going to be a male or a female. So this eliminates the whole process of getting the expensive DNA test. Another thing that they do at the feed store is they vaccinate all the chicks. Now, I didn't know anything about this. While America is still trying to figure out whether they want to get the COVID-19 vaccine, the last thing in my mind was, do these chicks have a vaccine? There are some diseases that are pretty rampant in backyard chickens and some commercial chickens here in California. And within the last few years, it's spread to some other states like Arizona and Texas. Now, I'm not uh, avion expert or nothing on this and i'm sure some people down in the comments can give us the name of whatever it is that they get but there are some vaccine that they receive when they're hatched that prevents them from getting these diseases and spreading it to other birds so make sure you do your research and find out if your chicks need any sort of vaccines for the area you're in and if at least get them on a medicated starter feed so that way you don't have to worry about any of your chicks dying which is our next topic chicks will die that's just the farm life you got to prepare for death and it kind of caught us off guard within three days of having our silkies they died i don't think that they had the vaccines that they needed they did take the time to sex them but in digging around doing a little bit of research i found out that this woman that we bought them from she really wasn't a reputable breeder she was more just like an instagram girl that was just snapping it for the gram and slanging chickens out of her backyard. She had way too many. I, I dug around the local code. She was breaking a few city ordinances. Her business was unregistered. She wasn't paying taxes. I went ahead and blew her into a couple agencies and just left it at that. I got more important things to do, like making videos for y'all and taking care of the chickens I still got than chasing her down. But please learn my lesson, do the research, and just don't be buying your chicks from any old person on Craigslist. I knew she was unprofessional because when I reached out to her and told her what was going on, she pretty much blamed me for it and then tried to make me feel bad. Didn't offer a discount on more chicks, didn't offer replacement chicks. So right after doing that, I knew she was a hack. And besides just the loss of the money, it really upset my wife and it was something that we kind of had to work through because we got these little chicks and we were expecting the turn of the chickens and then we literally watched them die in our hands. So it wasn't what we were trying to do on a Monday night. So have your mind in the game for the farm life. The second thing I wish we would have considered before we got our backyard flock is that they require more work than the pets we already have. The chickens poop constantly. 90 minutes after it hits their beak, it's coming out of their back and they eat 24 seven. Well, unless they're sleeping, but then they wake up and eat. If it wasn't for all the poop, I seriously do think they'd be more popular pets because they are a heck of a lot more fun at five bucks than a thousand dollar bird that never leaves its cage and doesn't lay any eggs. Besides the poop, they're constantly messing up their water. They're kicking their food everywhere. They're digging holes in the yard. My grass is completely annihilated compared to what it was when the chickens moved in. Now they do make some really good off the shelf, meaning you don't have to make or fabricate anything solutions for waters and feeders, but they're pretty expensive. They're like 50, 60, a hundred dollars a piece. And I think with a small flock size of three, it just doesn't really make any sense at this point to jump into that large of an investment. So I'm still just rocking the little food dish and water dish that I picked up in a small kit when I first brought the chickens home. The other requirement of attention that I would have immediately said no to the chickens is that they've really restricted our ability to travel. You always gotta keep an eye on the water, make sure it's full. You always gotta make sure the food's full, make sure they're not overheating, make sure they're not freezing and make sure that the predators aren't coming after them. It's kind of like a full-time job. I mean, I might be exaggerating a little bit, 
but it's definitely not as easy as a dog or a cat. So we can't go anywhere. We got to stay. Normally when we go somewhere, Daisy hops in the camper with us. Our cat Fugushima stays at home and she has someone that comes and checks up on her once and twice a day. Where do you find someone in the city to come and watch your dad dads? I don't know. That's a good app for someone out there that can develop it. The third thing I wish I would have considered before getting chickens is they are not a cheap hobby whatsoever. These chickens can get expensive. I just got to look at it right here so that way I don't mess these numbers up. So far we spent 170 on the birds alone, three of which are in chicken heaven. All right, we got another 50 on bedding. 40 on food, 30 on a heat lamp, 30 on food and watering devices, and 200 in the coop, plus an immeasurable amount of time taking care of them and scooping up the poop. We buy the organic free range eggs from our local grocery store for $4.50 a dozen. That means to break even just on the investment that we've made so far, these hens gotta lay 1,386 <laughs> eggs. With all three of these birds probably averaging around 250 eggs a year, that means it's going to take a little shy of two years to break even. And I, I got to say, that's probably just not going to happen. So unless you have the infrastructure in place, it is not that affordable. I'm sure maybe there's a certain flock size where the economics start to come around, but it's definitely not three. The fourth thing that I wish I would have considered before we got chickens is predators. They're everywhere. We pretty much live in the city here, so we don't got the hawks, we don't got the coyotes, but we do got the cats and the possums. Now, we built the hen house off from the fence or any kind of trees where they can hop down onto it and fortified it pretty good, so we don't have a problem with that. Our three biggest predators in this house is the dog, the cat, and the crows. The dog and the cat are a big time bummer because they both love spending time outside. Sometimes our cat will lay out here for like 12 hours at a time. So not being able to have the dog and the cat outside with the chickens at the same time is really cutting into our existing pets outdoor time. And it makes it kind of stressful constantly playing this shift change of are the chickens out, is the cat out and all that stuff. Plus part of our predator control uh, program that we were trying to operate here was to have the dog or the cat out here with the chickens to keep the crows from getting to them. Now the crows are a totally different type of predator because they're wild and we have no control. They fly over the house, they get visuals on those chickens and they want them. The crows around here are voracious hunters. They will sit up on a tree, they will sit up on a power line and just watch their prey until it's their moment to strike. I've seen them come down and pick up squirrels, fruit rats. These are crazy crows. Actually, after the first three chickens died, I taped them up into an Amazon box and had them in the front of the garage so that way we could go do a proper burial with them. Well, my wife opened up the garage door to go get something. And when she came back in the house, it was still open. The crows actually pulled the box with the dead chicks out of the garage. And then they pecked into it, got the dead chicks out and ate them. So these crows got murder and killing on their mind. And the fifth and final thing that I wish we would have considered and really took uh, seriously before we brought these bad boys home was you need to have everything ready before they even get here. Chickens need a lot more gear than say your dog or cat. It's not just here's your water, here's your food, go outside, go to the bathroom, come back in, get in my lap. No, they need bedding that has to constantly be replenished. They need the water. They're always tipping it over, screwing it up, kicking the bedding up into it. They eat constantly. So you're always topping the food off. And then when they get a little older, you got to have activities, a little something for them to roost on. Because if they get bored, they'll start pecking at each other, which isn't good because then they just turn into klepto peckers and they'll, they'll peck each other pretty much to death. So you got to keep them entertained. And then also these things, are they're growing very, very fast. So when we first got them home, we had them in a large rubber made tote, which seemed big, but then once you start putting all of the appliances and stuff in there, and then they start getting bigger and bigger every day, like doubling every two days in size, it gets smaller and smaller. So by day three, I was already heading out to my grocery store, begging them for a watermelon box that I probably should have already had. 
got that set up with the bedding and it was really nice for a little bit until they started to get bigger and they were ready to move outside and we hadn't had the coop ready yet once they're getting bigger they start kicking around they had so much dust thrown around our kitchen it looked like it was antiqued and then they were starting to the point where they were flying up out of the box so then I had a hustle to get the coop ready and we still hadn't decided whether we were gonna build something or buy something sort of prefabbed and assembled it. I was trying to find what the best value was because this was June, 2021, the big lumber gouging or, or shortage or whatever you wanna call it. It was $10 for a two by four here. I wasn't about that life, but I also wasn't about getting ripped off on a pre-made one because everything that I was looking at on walmart.com or amazon.com looked like it suffered from what I call the Amazon on effect and what that is is that's when you buy something and you're looking at the picture and it's got the photoshop chicken and everyone's having a good time and you get home and assemble it and it looks like a decoration that you would put in the bottom of like a 20 gallon fish tank looking at the measurements it, it appeared that most of these were that just fake fud chinese bs you're gonna get it home and it'd be enough room for maybe a bunny rabbit not the six hens that they say it will hold so be wary of those pre-made coops I ended up sourcing some pallet wood and building the one that we have, only purchasing just a few boards to frame the doors and a couple small sections on the run where I needed some longer pieces. The rest of it's just pallet wood, minimally engineered, used a bunch of hardware. I used screws instead of nails. I'm really not that good at swinging a hammer. Big ups to all the framers out there. I, I just don't got the swing. So I like using my Milwaukee screw gun. And the plus to this is when we're all done playing chicken farmer, I can just unscrew it, take it apart, toss the wood and save my hardware for the next project. I actually have some screws inside of this coop that are from three, four projects ago. So you'll definitely get your investment back on the screw hardware. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and get to this coop Dayville tour. So as you can see, man, this thing is pretty much no thrills. I really didn't uh, put much design consideration into it. Very, very simple construction. The run, I know it's kind of small, but like I said, they do get out quite a bit. And really they like just hanging out with each other. I mean, I feel like I could make this run a hundred feet long and they would all just be three cuddled up together in a corner. Now I got a couple different doors I put on it. I got one right here on the side. And this is how we get access to their food and water for now. And then eventually I'm gonna make a five gallon bucket nesting box that's just gonna go in right here. So that way I can just take it out, grab the eggs real quick and put it back in. At that point, I'll have to figure out a different solution for the water and food. I'll probably hang it up over here somewhere. So that's the side door. The run is just framed in with some little one by threes, a couple old two by fours. The front door's super simple, a couple hinges. It comes down like this and then I just put a center block in front of it. But for the most part, what's up Eagle? What's up Gurr? This is Eagle right here. She's by far the prettiest of our birds. She looks just like an Eagle. We joked when we first got her that, hey, is this an eagle or a chicken? But she's she's the most uh, inquisitive and kind of first one to roll up on you out of the gang. So yeah, and then here's the front face of the, uh, the coop part. We do have a little ramp, but they poop all over it and they really don't need it to get in and out right now. So we kind of been taking it out. For shade on the run, we just got these umbrellas, which is kind of like our overall shade solution in the backyard, because the way our yard is configured is the sun or shade doesn't stay in any one spot for more than like 30 or 40 minutes. So we're constantly moving them around to get the right shade. So when we leave for work in the morning, we get these to where they need to be. Up on the top, I got a couple little, little spikies here. Keep the crows from laying them where the door is. And then we got us one of them fake owls up there. It seems to be working pretty good. We move it every other day and the head rotates. Now for the door mechanism, it's a real simple kind of classic coupe. When I say I put very little design consideration into this, this is definitely 
a farmhouse style rig. Everything is just built with stuff I had around the house. This is just a piece of board I happened to have that was the right size. Put a little eye in it, tied a line to it, bring it up, made kind of like a little improvised like dock cleat. And we just worked the line a few times and that holds the door open. Now for the roof, it's just a really big piece of pallet. It's probably about eight feet long. So it overhangs the back of the coop just a little bit. It overhangs the back of the coop just a little bit. And then it also overhangs the front portion here to provide some extra shade. One thing that a lot of people talked about when they made their coops is they wish they had more ventilation. This roof actually sits up quite high off this top board, so we have ample through ventilation. And then when it does get cool at nights here, I mean, you gotta remember we're in Northern California, it doesn't get that hot. We just put this down to kill the draft. And then we have another tarp we put over it if it's raining, but it never ever rains here. Drought 2021, what's up? And then out here on this side, we have another door with two latches, and this is how we get access to the inside to clean it. All right, once you're on the inside, you can see the bedding is flying everywhere. You can see all the poop and feathers and mess I'm talking about. Up there, that's their roosting board. That's where they sleep. You wanna do kind of like a flat wide board, not a round one. These chickens just like laying on flat boards, I guess. That's at least what I found in my research. Another design consideration that I put in here was this right here. They call it a roosting board. And the whole purpose of this is that most of the time when the, when the birds are in here, they're gonna be sleeping. So that means most of the time they're pooping, they're gonna be pooping right above the roost. So you put this roosting board in and then you can just pull it out like you know every day, every other day, hose it off, let it dry and put it back in. That way you're not sifting through all of that bedding trying to get the poop out because you can see and the rest of the coop, there really is not much poop. It's mostly just feathers, because they'll just hop out and do their thing over there. And that's pretty much it with the coop. It's really no thrills, pretty much 100% functional. I didn't frame anything in. I just took a pallet on the bottom that happened to have some plywood on it, put pallets on all four sides, put a pallet as the roof, and then just kind of built a little screened in patio up off the front of it. A lot of people online really uh, kind of overbuild their coops, which I mean, if you were in a place where you knew you were going to be staying for some time and you had a large flock or in stream weather, I understand. But in our situation, something like this was just the best. We're probably only going to be living in this spot for another two years. And I don't even know if the chickens will be living here at that point. So stay tuned for more chicken videos. If you're into it, if you found me just searching for chicken stuff, hit subscribe. You never know what you're going to find on this channel. I'm like shot out of a cannon here. So we'll either be cooking on the Traeger, working on the camper, scooping chicken poop, or who knows, uh, mowing the lawn or something. I don't know. Thanks a lot for tuning in, guys. Jason for JTV. I'll see you all next time. Hey. Oh, yeah.